those who are joining late please help out with the page numbers page number 276 chapter 14 dietary infections and fever so infections there are different types of infections viral bacterial parasitic fungal okay prion's disease etc so any infection which the uh, which has occurred in the body there will be a rise in temperature definitely okay general malaise that is fatigue weakness loss of certain senses like taste smell etc these could be the signs and symptoms and infections are transmitted from person a to person b there are different various modes of transmission as well okay so these are the different uh, modes of transmission we have airborne transmission droplet and contact transmission airborne is the most fastest way of transmitting an infection since the particle here infectious particle are so lightweight it is less than 5 micron uh, meter in its diameter so so lightweight uh, that along with the air currents even if the if there is no fan or air conditioning or any uh, uh, any artificial uh, uh, heating or ventilation system in a room still with the natural air current that exists in the room it the the particles can travel from one room to another room infecting a various other uh, various other people who are in contact with the patient okay next is droplet droplet uh, is still much more less transmissible based on the size of the infectious particle it is larger than 10 micrometer in, di uh, in diameter so it can't travel far it stays quite near to the patient two to three feet near to the patient wherever the patient is infected patient is so you can be in the same room as the patient without using your personal protective equipment but if you approach the patient if you are getting closer to the patient as a a nurse or as a health provider as a doctor when you're approaching the patient who has known to be diagnosed with droplet inf infection that's when you have to wear your personal protective equipments like goggles mask usually we go for mask and gloves okay but other equipments can also be added on okay the last is contact based transmission contaminated surfaces or when you directly touch the patient who is infected okay like uh, uh, chicken pox uh, typhoid okay so, uh, and uh, uh, other other transmissible diseases like vre MRSA. okay uh, these are highly contagious diseases they also transmit through contact transmission okay even if you use the articles that the patient has used okay in case of cholera etc uh, if you uh, gastro certain gastroenteral fevers etc if you are using the articles or using the same bathrooms toilet seats as the patient you could also get infected okay So effect of infection on your nutritional status. What does infection do? If you are sick, if you are infected, what happens to your body's natural nutritional status? Okay. First is impaired appetite. You will lose your interest in food. You will not feel hungry. Okay. Even if, if, even if a person is hungry, uh, he or she will not have the enthusiasm to eat okay they are like i can still uh, manage my hunger i i can still uh, i don't have to worry about my hunger it's better to not eat uh, than i can i can just terribly uh, just just suffer through my hunger so that's the kind of attitude a person may have when they get infections or when they fall ill okay next we have impaired absorption uh, poor absorption of your fats proteins all your mi micro as well as micronutrients uh, absorption will be impacted also digestive issues could be also uh, uh, will be will be present along with infection that could also hinder your absorption increased requirements usually the in uh, requirement is a great deal of carbohydrate and protein when you are sick your body requires a lot of energy load as well as protein Okay, so that's the uh, requirement that increases when you're sick. Then drug and nutrition, uh, nutrient intra uh, interactions, whenever a certain drug prescription is given to you, okay, uh, doctors usually tell you what you should eat or what, should, what you should avoid for these many days as long as you are on this particular drug. Okay, because various drugs are known to inhibit your food absorption. Usually, most of the drugs that you take will inhibit your calcium, iron absorption okay these are the uh, nutrients 
micronutrients that are usually impacted okay uh, uh, they are impacted a lot with the uh, with uh, with any other drugs that you are being prescribed on okay increased metabolic rate you burn out your energies too fast and that is for us the reason why your metabolism is too high when you are sick when you are uh, feverish or when you are sick your metabolism rate is so high that when you recover you will notice that you have lost a lot of weight okay that is your body is eating up it uh, it's eating its own proteins and it is emptying its own glycogen stores okay so that is the reason why there is an increased metabolic rate then we have decreased glycogen and adipose st stores same okay uh, your first your glycogen stores will get depleted and later after the glycogen store depletion it goes to the adipose stores okay fat as well as carbohydrate depletion takes place in your body but that is the body is in a catabolic state okay your body goes in a catabolic state it is eating up its own energy stores and fat stores for survival increased catabolism of proteins the body will break down its own proteins for amino acids and these amino acids will in turn be used for survival of other vital functions loss of water sodium and potassium when when you are recovering from a fever uh, when you get your sweat uh, in, uh, intermittent sweat uh, uh, chills etc uh, and you lose a lot of sodium as well as electrolytes through urination as well okay when you are feverish when you are recovering from your fever you must have noticed you go you go to the bathroom runs a whole lot uh, longer as uh, as your healthy days as compared to your healthy days okay so that is a, that is an excessive loss of so uh, electrolytes and water through urine as well as through your sweat so general dietary considerations what you can take care of okay when or you can take care of a family member as well whoever is ill or sick or suffering from infections these are the general guidelines which you can follow so energy the total ca calorie requirement for a day should be around uh, 600 to 1200 if it's if it is kids and teenagers you can keep it below 1000 for adults you can go about 1000 okay protein 100 gram or more protein you have to take a lot of protein because body is in a catabolic state body is eating up its own protein for survival okay so to prevent that catabolism to take the body out of catabolic state you have to provide it with double the amount of protein what you usually have okay usually an adult who has a sedentary lifestyle will have about 50 to 60 gram of protein okay irrespective of, of their height weight age etc and gender an adult who is in a sedentary lifestyle should have at least 50 to 60 grams of protein per day okay but when they are sick when they have fallen ill when they are recovering the protein intake doubles okay 100 gram or more means it is double the requirement of a normal day okay that carbohydrates be liberal as much as carbohydrates you can avail you can have it okay have as much as rice as possible or uh, chapatis and uh, uh, like uh, rice like try to have something that is gluten free okay uh, even uh, wheat has a lot of energy wheat is packed with energy but it also has gluten and that would be difficult on feverish days okay for your intestine to break down that okay so it's better to opt for rice or broken rice broken wheat okay uh, and any millets as well millets like ragi, jowar, bajra, okay, you can go for that as well. Anything that is gluten-free will be ideal, but which is rich in carbohydrates. When, uh, when a person is sick, see, when a person is sick, 1,200 and 600 kilocalories will also sound a whole lot of food for them, okay? From a healthy person's point of view, okay when you are seeing 600 to 1200 you will feel it is quite less okay but when you ask uh, but when you translate these calories into plate into three different meals or at least one meal or two meals okay when you translate these many calories into two meal a day you will see the amount and portion of food that a sick person has to eat from their perspective from a sick person's perspective even 600 kilocalories will sound pretty high in quantity Okay. 
then fats you have to be very judicious in use do not overuse the uh, fat keep it as low as possible because uh, if the fat are not getting absorbed and uh, definitely we have seen the impact of fever on nutritional status there is a decreased absorption of all the macronutrients including fat if the fat is not absorbed and there is a whole lot of fat in the food it will lead to diarrhea okay it will lead to diarrhea because already uh, the gi system your gut your intestines are are in a state of underperformance on top of that if you give them a fat load it will it will add on to the symptoms of of infection okay so to prevent that keep the use of fats as minimum as possible you can't completely take it off the chart do not take the fats off the chart of the menu fat has to be given but to be conscious you can give them around 15 to 20 grams of fat per day okay 15 to 20 grams of fat per day uh, irrespective of their age and gender that is a healthy way okay maximum 20 20 grams could be given don't go more than that when they are sick when they are recovering you can slowly add the uh, increase the amount of fat to 5 or 10 grams okay coming to minerals you can take ors solution or you can have lime water with salt okay salted lime water uh, and whatever food you are giving them whatever food you are giving to a sick person uh, at the end just add two to three pinches of salt okay make the food a bit salty because we want to retain a lot of water because when a person is sick and when the fever is leaving their body it is expected that the person will void a lot void means urinate a lot or they will sweat a lot so they're losing a lot of water and electrolytes as it is so to compensate that we add a bit more of salt so that so that salt helps in retaining a bit more of water it will not lead the patient go into a state of dehydration okay so that's what you have to be careful of fruit juices and milk can also be given when you're adding uh, even when you're giving them fruit juices fresh fruit juices add a pinch of salt and give it to them whatever food you are having just add a little bit extra pinches of salt into it and then provide it to the sick person vitamins a b and c complex b and c complex why because it is water soluble along with water loss which we have just just now discussed there is a lot of lo loss of vitamin c and vitamin b complex as well okay so you have to compensate that with fresh fruits okay uh, any rice water like kanji water etc or give them porridge for porridge of millets that is also quite rich in vitamin b complex okay so you can um, and definitely give them any orange juice mango juice or something that is yellow orange color fruit juices okay, fruit or vegetable juice carrot juice okay carrot and beetroot juice abc juice can be given abc juice is very high uh, has a very high concentration of vitamin a in form of beta carotene okay so these juices are good fluid intake for through the throughout the day is 2.5 to 5 liters here when i so, uh, say fluid intake it is not just water it's all the fluids like soups fruit juices porridge milk whatever the patient had uh, in liquid form okay in liquid or semi liquid or clear fluid form whatever the patient had even glucose water lime juice whatever the patient had throughout the day including all that it is fluid intake should be with, within uh, 2.5 to 5 liters it's not just about water okay you can't expect a sick person to have 5 liters of water okay so it's it's all the fluids throughout the meals what you have provided including including all that the fluid intake should be in this range abc juice stands for a stands for apple b stands for beetroot c stands for carrot then bland food don't give them spicy food since the gastrointestinal tract your gi system is still recovering spices will uh, diminish the absorption quality okay so spicy food or too much of temper tempered food seasoned food don't give them that seasoned in the sense it's not seasonal food seasoned means uh, when you make a chalk out of the oil okay you uh, heat the oil put some spices into it let it sputter and then pour it over your uh, cook uh, dal or, uh, or whatever subsidies you have prepared okay so that is 
seasoning the food. So don't give them too much of a tempered and seasoned food with spices and oils. Uh, uh, restrict, restrict that and give them bland food. Every two to three hours intervals, something, uh, something has to be ingested in form of fluid, liquid diet, semi-solid snacks or something. Uh, something every two to three hours it should be ingested. Short, uh, small meals, but it, at frequent intervals can be given. That will not be hard on them, not hard on their stomach, and even it will not affect the insulin much, insulin levels much. Next, coming to specific fevers, typhoid fever. Positive agent is salmonella typhi. Okay, uh, it, it it can be spread through contaminated food, water, and even using the articles like contact transmission. Okay, using the uh, uh, utensils, towels, sharing the clothes, or sharing the room, uh, sharing the washroom with a person who has infected who has been infected with salmonella typhi could also lead to transmission of uh, this. Uh, this infection okay so usually it is dirty uh, eating unhygienic food having unhygienic practices of cooking and uh, take uh, um, like handling food okay if it is unhygienic salmonella typhi can spread so symptoms are white coating on the tongue and uh, internal symptoms which you can't see externally but internal symptom is there will be ulceration wound wound that may take place within the intestine Okay, and this ulceration could bleed as well. There will be bleeding from these ulcers as well, and that will that will show up in the stools. The, uh, the stools will be tarry black in color because and the blood is being uh, the blood is oozing out of the intestine. By the time it reaches large intestine and from the, uh, through the rectum and from the anus, it is when it is uh, uh, dispelled out of the body. It has already undergone coagulation. Coagulation means the blood that has that has been oozed out of the small intestine. It undergoes blood clotting coagulation throughout the digestion process. That is the reason why the stools may appear dark, black, and tarry. Okay, so that is one one of a classical symptom which may uh, we, through which we can diagnose that the patient may be suffering from salmonella type uh, typhoid fever. Okay. And there will be rashes on the body, which could be taken up for other skin rashes, or it could be taken up as a dermatology case as well. So don't depend on rashes on the body. Sliver and spleen will be enlarged. Uh, that uh, how how can you test that? If you if you just press the area where the uh, in the in the right side under the rib cage when you press that that is uh, your liver is present there okay so the patient will have tenderness okay as soon as you touch that area the patient will feel the pain uh, so uh, that could be a uh, sign that the patient has an enlarged liver that is hepatomegaly and splenomegaly splenomegaly means enlarged spleen okay the same on the left side if you uh, do palpate the uh, the patient's body uh, the patient will show some signs of tenderness, discomfort, and pain. Okay, so it means the patient is having enlarged organs in these areas. Usually, these enlarged organs are spleen and uh, liver, hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. So these are the symptoms, and this is about what typhoid fever is. Okay, so what is a diet plan which you can give for typhoid fever? Start with clear liquids. Why clear liquids? Because the intestine is wounded. Okay, there are ulcers in the intestine. The intestine is wounded. The intestine cannot function properly. It is the it is functionally impaired. So you can't expect the typhoid patient to have solid food, hard food, and you can't put additional pressure on the intestine to break it down and digest it. So we go for clear fluids, which is very easy on your stomach and your gut. Okay, so examples of clear fluids are given here: water, fruit juices. Broth, broth, broth means the bone broth or vegetable broth can also be given for vegetarians. Okay, gelatin, like broth is also called as paya soup in India. Uh, I don't know what is the other name. Uh, people from other parts of India uh, who who has an idea of what a broth is, please mention in the chat box what it is called in your local language. In Maharashtra and Karnataka, it's all it's usually called paya. Mutton paya, chicken paya, paya soup. They usually don't use the uh, meat part of the non-vegetarian food. They only use the bones for preparing the bone broth or any broth 
soups. Usually it only bones are used with a very little uh, meat pieces on it. If you have any other names, local names, which we use in India from other parts of the country, you can share it in the chat box for others to know what, what it is exactly. And then we have gelatin, sports drink, um, fr frozen fruit juices, which can be given as popsicles. Yeah, boiled rice, rice water, that is kanyi. Okay. Kanyi will not usually come under a broth, but it is a clear fluid. Okay, it's, it's a diet that comes under clear, clear fluid. Okay. Tea and coffee without milk or any creamer. Okay, that, that is black tea, black coffee. These things come under the clear liquids examples. Okay, then slowly after a week or after a few days of clear, uh, clear liquids, you can, uh, don't wait for a week because that will be nutritionally, nutritionally impaired. The patient may get nutritionally impaired. So first few days, as, as what the doctor has prescribed after the clear fluids, we can move on to full fluid, uh, full liquids. So anything, uh, everything that, that we have discussed so far on clear fluid that is added, that is continued. Along with that, we slowly introduced milk products as well. Okay, we can start giving them uh, the, the milk coffee, milk tea, lattes, okay, hot cereals, porridge, uh, cre creamier version of soups, not the clear soups, creamier versions of soups can also be given, custard, puddings, porridge, okay, uh, some nutritional supplements, if digestion, uh, if they are nutritionally impaired, but you can't give them solid food, you can uh, completely depend on nutritional supplements in this case. Then soft diet, it is uh, easy to chew, easy to swallow, okay. Uh, like dal khichdi, the, uh, the, the more liquid version of the dal khichdi, kanyi along with the rice, okay, those are com those comes under soft diet, mashed, mashed, uh, boiled vegetables, uh, mashed fruits, etc. Okay, smoothie, whatever, whatever fruit smoothie or vegetable smoothie you prefer, that also come under soft diet. Then finally, we go into low residue diet. Again, it is easy to di uh, digest. The uh, all the dry food like uh, wheat chapatis, etc., that will be avoided. Okay, wheat chapatis or chapatis made of jowar, bajra, etc. Th those are on the drier and harder side. Okay, and anything made up of made with refined flour like maida that will be avoided. Okay, avoid high fiber food or uh, food because if the fiber quantity in the food is high, definitely the food will not stay for a long time in the intestine because of the fiber content. The fi uh, the food will just move out of your intestine. So to prevent that, if the uh, if the food moves out of the intestine without getting absorbed properly, it will not do any justification to correct the nutritional impairment. Okay, so avoid high fiber food. Some part of fibers can be used, okay, uh, just for the sake of easy uh, excretion, okay. Whole grain, bread, cereals, etc. that can be avoided, nuts, seeds, dry fruits that are, that are hard, dry and rich in fiber, avoid that. Next, coming to influenza, what all uh, symptoms you have come across in like whenever you had a common cold, okay? Those all symptoms will come under influenza. Examples of influenza are your COVID-19. COVID-19, uh, coronavirus-19 is a influenza. Swine flu, H1N1 is an influenza. SARS, severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome. Uh, that's an influenza. Okay, there are different kind of influenza depending on which country you come from. Every country has its own vi uh, virulent factor of influenza, seasonal flus, etc. Okay, so these are the signs and symptoms which you have for influenza. You can take a screenshot of it, like headache. Everyone will not have the same symptom for influenza. If even if two people are suffering from the same uh, vir uh, virulent influenza, they may have slightly different symptoms okay but in general these are all the symptoms one may find in a flu patient so headache runny stuffy nose sore throat body ache if it is viral then definitely a body ache will be there bacterial fever will not give uh, it, it will have, give you body pain but it is not 
at the high intensity what a viral infection gives you okay viral uh, body aches in viral infection are far more intense as compared to bacterial infection then systemic uh, you have fever usually high fever uh, muscles will be tired fatigued muscle aches will be there along with body ache respiration uh, coughing and sometimes put may come sometimes it may be dry cough as well vomiting joint aches so all the dietary considerations which we had discussed for fever okay the same thing you have to follow in influenza as well okay uh, give them high calorie diet high carbohydrate diet focus more on protein avoid fats okay keep the patient hydrated okay add more vitamin c rich fruit juices and fruits in their diet as much as possible we do not have a complete evidence of it but it is claimed it is said and it is also believed that if you are suffering from common cold or any influenza related disorders adding more vitamin c rich food in your diet will reduce your symptoms it will not cure it will uh, vitamin c is not supposed to cure your influenza it is supposed to reduce your symptoms it vitamin c supplements as well as food rich in vitamin c can aid in bringing down your symptoms it can do symptomatic management okay next coming to malaria so the entire life cycle of a malarial parasite is given here in this chart i guess most of us are already aware of it since our school times etc we we are studying about the life cycle of this female anopheles mosquito uh, and the parasite which survives in female anopheles mosquito as well as a human host okay so this parasite the, the malarial, malarial parasite requires two host bodies one is the mosquito one is the human host so two host bodies is required for its reproduction okay it has sexual as well as asexual forms of reproduction this parasite okay so the host mosquito will uh, first uh, from a malarial infected infected patient uh, the liver cells are also infected it will produce infected rbcs when the female anopheles mosquito comes and uh, sucks on the uh, bites the infected person takes the rbcs from the infected person goes to the second person and uh, drops the same infected blood into the second person this is where the uh, infection starts okay this is how the uh, it it continues okay so so now the second person is also infected again the mosquito will come and bite the second person go to some other person and deposit the same infected rbcs in their blood stream okay so the parasite uh, uses the mosquito as well as the human host to continue this cycle life cycle of a malarial parasite okay so it remember this thing two hosts are, hosts are required for the propagation of malarial, malarial parasite a female anopheles mosquito as well as a human host so symptoms of malaria high and high and continuous recurring fever recurring means intermittent fever in the morning 6 am you had high fever within 2 hours it came down by 9 am or 10 uh, 10 am again you had high fever so throughout the day the fever spikes up it comes down spikes up and comes down you have at least 3 to 4 rounds of this spiking up and coming down okay so that is an intermittent fever recurring fever so that's a classical sign of the patient may be suffering from malaria intermittent profuse sweating as soon as your fever comes down okay not during the high fever but when the fever is coming down that's when you have this intense sweating okay and as soon as the fever again spikes up you will you will be released of the sweating symptom okay again it comes back in a cycle shaking chills whenever you when the fever is high the patient will have chills as well okay so no cold application is given for malaria only hot applications are given onset of headache and vomiting headache and vomiting is not a common symptom it depends from a, a case to case okay not all malarial infected patients may have headache and vomiting but intermittent fever profuse uh, uh, sweating and chills okay these are the classical signs which can say that the patient may be suffering from malaria headache and vomiting hot application means uh, see uh, giving hot water bath okay uh, keeping uh, keeping the patient warm 
whatever conditions you try to keep the patient warm okay when the patient is having chills you you uh, you will dip cotton uh, cotton uh, cloth pieces in hot water or lukewarm water and you will do uh, keep that uh, warmed up hot, hot water cloth onto the patient's body etc to bring down the shivering to bring down the chills so these things comes under hot applications okay if the patient is not having if the patient is not suffering from malaria it is some other infection okay in which there is definitely high fever but the patient is not having any shivering or chills okay when the shivering and chills are not present in that case you can give cold application cold application means uh, dipping the cotton cloth or muslin cloth in ice water and placing it on the underarms head neck okay uh, all the joints of the patient to relieve the fever okay that is cold application cold drinks can also be given to relieve the fever okay shaking and chills does not only happen in malaria even in chikungunya and dengue also we see this happening okay then uh, the the dietary management of malaria is the same like fever okay whatever we have discussed for fever and influenza same you have to follow for malaria next coming to tuberculosis so india ranks high okay india still ranks quite high in the number of uh, tuberculosis cases what we get on a daily basis okay and to uh, as a preventive measure we have this pcg vaccine it is given to kids uh, at birth as soon as the child is born okay within uh, that day or within the next day uh, that pcg vaccine is given to the child pcg vaccine is not functional for adults okay once you have grown up once you are uh, once you have grown out of your infancy your newborn stage then pcg vaccine is not functional okay it, it works only for infants so uh, we have dots therapy uh, in india to control the transmission of tuberculosis as well as we have uh, tuberculosis isolation hospitals as well okay uh, these hospitals are reserved for tb patients only okay uh usually in most of the hospitals where they do not have isolation rooms or isolation beds whenever they come across a tb patient these patients are referred directly to the state authorized district authorized um hospitals isolation hospitals which are meant for treating only the tb patients okay and even nowadays we have multi drug resistant tb okay multi drug resistant tb means the the common uh the common pharmaceuticals which we use for dots therapy that is your rifampicin isoniazid pyridazine ethambutol streptomycin these drugs do not work on multi drug resistant tuberculosis okay there are, there are cases in it is, it is because of the antibiotic resistance that is taking place okay so in such cases mrd cases we have to definitely transfer the patient into isolation hospitals not even isolation rooms we have to transmit to transfer the mrd mrd tb uh, tuberculosis cases into isolation hospitals okay because it is highly infectious and very dangerous okay uh, the recent and the most updated classes of antibiotics has to be used for multi drug resistant tuberculosis infections okay it it is it cannot be stopped just by streptomycin or any other forms of tb drugs so that's about tuberculosis and these are the symptoms which we have which we have in initial stages of tuberculosis there is a persistent cough okay persistent cough that lasts more than 4 weeks 4 or 5 weeks okay and along with the cough uh, in the later stages of this cough uh, th there is blood in the sputum okay the blood in the sputum that is a sign of tb fatigue and the patient loses a lot of weight okay there is a lot of muscle wasting a lot of muscle wasting lot of protein loss in the from the body sweating at night fever chest pain chest pain is a, uh, is only seen when it is a pulmonary tuberculosis okay there are different types of tuberculosis pulmonary tuberculosis that is your respiratory tuberculosis is the most common one okay there is a tuberculosis that can affect your bones another form of tuberculosis that can uh, they can that can affect your large intestine okay 
gastrointestinal stomach in your spinal cord okay some dangerous cases that can affect your brain as well so tuberculosis bacilli bacilli is the is the bacteria okay so that this bacilli can infect any part of your body but your pulmonary tuberculosis the respiratory ones the bacilli that, that affects the lungs that is the most common cases which we see in india okay so chest pain and lung damage is seen only in pulmonary tuberculosis and what kind of damage it happens uh, to your lungs is that the lungs will undergo scarring okay uh, wherever the bacilli has created ulcers where, wherever it has created pus in the lungs after getting uh, after removing the pus etc through your sputum and your cuff uh, that that area of the, the affected, infected area of the lung undergoes scarring okay and when there is a lot of scarring tissue that is taking place in your lungs the lungs will never grow back the healthy tissue in the, in place of that scarred area okay once the body part undergoes scarring it is there for the lifetime it will never go back to its healthy state okay so the function of the uh, lungs is deteriorated for your lifetime okay So these are the anti-tuberculosis -tuberculo uh, drugs which we give. So you can use the mnemonic called RIPE, R-I-P-E, okay, with which you can remember the drug name. So even for your general knowledge, remembering these four drug name is quite important, okay. So under DOTS therapy, uh, DOTS therapy stands for direct observed therapy, short term, okay. Six months to nine months is what it range. Nowadays, they say it is nine months, okay, but usually the first initial uh, two months, you will give four drugs. All the four drugs are given. Later, the remaining months, either four months or uh, seven months, only two drugs are given. So the first two months is the intensive period. Okay, The first two months of once you are diagnosed with tuberculosis, the first two months is the intensive period when all the four drugs are given in high doses. And slowly, only two uh, after two months is over, for, uh, for the rest of the DOT therapy months, only two drugs will be given, okay? So first line of drugs are, are, the, are the isonia, citrofampicin, pyridazamine, ethambutol, and streptomycin. Streptomycin is the antibiotic here. So this is given. And the second line of drug, which came after it, uh, 10 to 20 years back, these drugs were dis discovered. That are the second line of drugs. And the newer drugs are the ciprofloxacin, oxofloxacin. These are, these are a lot of antibiotics. Why we are having second line and newer drugs coming up is that uh, now we have new cases called multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So it is very difficult to treat these infections just by the first line of drugs, which we had from day one. Okay. So these antibiotics and these drugs are no longer working on the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis infections okay we require newer drugs more expensive ones more well-researched ones okay to treat multi-drug resistant tuberculosis infections so these this is about the drugs used in tuberculosis so the dietary management for a person who is suffering from tuberculosis energy requirement is 2500 to 3000 kilocalories so again here you have to be very liberal with carbohydrates as well as protein we'll see that protein has to be around 80 to 120 grams that is double the actual amount of what an average healthy adult has okay double the amount usually 80 to 120 gram of protein is taken up by athletes okay people who go for gyms and they have this endurance level activities resistant training okay uh, uh, bodybuilders, wrestlers, uh, heavy uh, heavy weighters, etc. So they they have this quality of protein, this quantity of protein. Okay, so the protein amount given to TB patient is also this high. Yeah, muscle. Uh, we'll come to that. What exactly dietary? What exa exactly you have to give to the patients? We'll come to that with examples. Calcium, iron, and phosphorus. So whatever food is rich in calcium, iron, and phosphorus, usually your sesame seeds, milk, 
okay uh, calcium rich fruits and vegetables they all, they all can be given fresh fruits and vegetables can be given for other micro minerals as well again here vitamin a c and d has to be focused on vitamin a you can get get through uh, non vegetarian food as well as uh, the yellow and orange fruits and vegetables vitamin c all your fresh fruits and vegetables raw fruits and vegetables can give you vitamin c you can also take the help of supplements okay if the patient is not able to keep up with high caloric demands you can definitely go for nutritional supplements here vitamin d as well because muscle wasting has taken place the the patient has lost a lot of vitamin d from their skin okay uh, soon after muscle wasting a loss of vitamin d also takes place to replenish it vitamin d is required vitamin d again uh, usually for tb patients we do give supplementation we will not just depend on diet for vitamin d supplementation of diet vitamin d is given high calorie diet fluid and soft diet is recommended here high calorie because uh, you can't expect the a sick patient who who has this recurrent cough um, blood in their sputum such patients to have a diet that is so high like 3000 kilo calories is a high calorie diet okay and expect them to have solid food okay it, it should be a food that is easy to just gulp down because uh, usually what happens if you give them too much of solid food while eating and uh, while eating if they get uh, bouts of coughing okay uh, so what what will happen next you can just imagine like when you are eating some eating a food and you get bouts of coughing what could happen to you so just just think about it just apply certain certain degree of common sense to it what would happen yeah vomiting can happen definitely a person can choke on their food it is highly dangerous they can even die just by while having food aspiration can take place aspiration means food is supposed to go in through the esophagus to your stomach okay so while you are eating food when you cough the food uh, food particles may go into your trachea that is your wind pipe and that could lead to pneumonia okay just so just imagine the situation a person is already having a deprived lungs on top of it the patient is getting pneumonia okay so it's a very risky case so that's the reason why we give them a uh, fluid and soft diet easy to chew easy to swallow okay and which the, which will not put the patient's ha life on risk okay so during fever uh, if the patient along with tb definitely it's, it's a bacterial infection there will be fever rise in body temperature every 3 hour interval soft diet is prescribed with improvement high protein diet can be given so first of all you have to concentrate on getting back the energy with high carbohydrate diet within 2 to 3 days you can concentrate on protein uh, protein in diet as well so 1 liter of milk it is uh, try to make them have 1 ml of milk it, it sounds quite a, a big amount with in, in terms of quantity but if they are not willing to have milk the substitute of milk like butter milk or curd okay these things can be given so at least 1 liter of milk and 3 to 4 eggs on a daily basis is prescribed for tb patients so that's the dietary management here is it clear with tuberculosis what management you have to do yeah milk is given for protein requirement calcium phosphorus requirement as well and milk is also a good source of carbohydrates okay it's rich in lactose protein powder as well as shakes can also be added 
protein powder into smoothies, fruit juices, smoothies, porridges. Cereals which are grainy in consistency should be avoided because that could lead to aspiration. Okay. Cereals which are boiled and smashed properly, that could be given. So next coming to HIV versus AIDS, AIDS topic. So HIV stands for human deficiency virus. AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Okay. HIV is the virus. AIDS is the last stage of this infection. Okay. Last stage of the infection and not every HIV patient, everyone who has been infected with HIV will uh, reach this AIDS state. Okay. AIDS is not uh, all the say all and be all of all the HIV infections. Okay. Very few people who have been infected with HIV uh, ends up with AIDS. Okay. And once the AIDS, uh, once they go into the state of AIDS, okay, uh, within three to four months, they pass away. Okay. As soon as the AIDS infection has started, with, uh, they hardly survive for a few months after that. Okay. So HIV is the virus that invades your immunity system. So when we talk about, like whenever we talk about HIV in test, we always use the word scopy. Okay, by the this virus is called as copies, copies per ml. Uh, this person has mm -hmm. uh, one lakh uh, HIV copies per ml of the blood sample. So like that, that's that's what we use. Okay? Why, why we use copies? Because HIV virus enters a human uh, host body, uh, and they directly go into the DNA in in your cell in within your nucleus. You have the DNA. Okay, whatever cell is infected, this virus will directly go to the DNA level. And it will use the enzyme called reverse transcriptase, okay? And makes the copy of itself, okay? So you can imagine a situation where um, a thief has invaded somebody's shop, which had a photocopy machine. And it uh, and this thief has started making photocopies of himself, his own photo, started he making cop photo photocopies of himself to invade other cells, okay? It's a it's a very simple analogy which I can use here to explain how the virus the virus is spreading in a human body. Okay, so it spreads uh, from the nucleus level from the DNA level. It uses this enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Okay, it in, uh, it it becomes the RNA. Uh, the virus itself becomes RNA in your body, and from that RNA, it creates its own photocopies. It, it own, uh, creates its own forms of viruses and it invade, it releases these viruses into, into the bloodstream and the virus will travel throughout your body. This is how HIV infection takes place. There are other um, enzymes, chemicals, other uh, agents involved, but in short, just to explain you how it functions in the body, this is the storyline that we have, okay? So coming to AIDS, it is the last, last stage of the spectrum of condition. Initially, it is just the infection. Your body has HIV virus. That's the initial stage. But as years pass by, okay, uh, sometimes you can go 14 to 15 years without any signs and symptoms of HIV. A person could be infected with HIV. He or she is not at all aware that he's infected with HIV. They can go for 10 to 14 years without any clinical signs and symptoms. Okay, and during that 10 to 14 years, uh, when they are not aware that it, they themselves are infected, they can infect others as well. Okay, so that's how dangerous it is. It depends what speed it multiplies, it completely depends. Okay, we, uh, we as humans, we have this natural genetic mutations. Okay, whenever this genetic mutation is taking place in our body, when this virus is using the reverse transcriptase enzyme, creating its own RNA, okay? It, our, our human antibodies are aware of it, okay? Some people have a strong genetic mutation in themselves. They can prevent this transcription from taking place, okay? But uh, others are not as lucky as it is, okay? So the speed at which this virus multiplies is different from every subject, okay? It depends upon your your genetics it depends upon the viral load which you have received okay if you keep on having like for example let's take 
uh, unprotected uh, sexual intercourse okay uh, if the if a person engages in unprotected sexual uh, intercourse over a period of time with multiple partners who all have been at a point of the time infected with hiv virus definitely the viral load in this person increases okay and with a high viral load definitely the speed of multiplication will also increase so it is completely different and sometimes some infection causing uh, some some strains of hiv virus are not that strong enough to cause multiplication too fast but some strains are quite strong enough to cause the multiplication quite fast okay so the, it depends on what kind of uh, virus strain have you been infected with okay so we can't say definitely this is the speed with which it multiplies because every case it's a different story, okay? So patients will suffer with minor difficulties, small symptoms, very very much similar to flu, okay? And that will that could be just misconstrued as it's a common cold or it's an influenza, okay? Nobody will go and take a ELISA test or HIV test just because they had common cold, okay? So they just brush it off that it is just a cold, it's just a fever, flu, okay? and they may recover with from that as well. In AIDS, when a patient has reached the stage of AIDS, that is the final stage of HIV infection, they experience severe signs and symptoms, and even a common cold will disrupt their quality of life. Even with a common cold, they become bedridden, okay? So this is the difference between HIV and AIDS. So these are the different stages of four stages of HIV and AIDS. The stage one primary lasts to uh, it will last from one to six weeks soon after the infection. As soon as the body has received HIV infection, it could be through uh, undetected blood transfusion, okay, sharing needles for during drug abuse or sharing needles for medicines, etc. For any any purpose, if you are sharing used needles, okay, that could lead to HIV unprotected sexual intercourse or having multiple sexual partners okay via breast milk as well if the mother is infected okay via breast milk as well hiv could be transferred to the infant okay during uh, labor uh, uh, if it is a uh, if it is a normal vaginal delivery uh, it is not that harmful but if it is c-section okay there are high chances that the child may get infected okay then we have no symptoms at all uh, in primary state. It goes completely undetected. And during this primary stage, this infected person can transmit the infection to various other people as well. Okay. So infected person can infect other people. So in next is the second stage, asymptomatic. There is no symptom here as well. Okay. This can last for at least 10 years. And uh, this stage is again symptom free. There may be some swollen lymph nodes okay glands like uh, under your uh, like the the area where your tonsils are present okay under your cheeks your armpit area the inguinal region your groin area okay they, they these areas are rich in lymph nodes okay of your lymphatic system lymph nodes okay lymph nodes uh, make your antibodies okay so there will be slight, slight swelling in these areas sometimes they have difficulty in swallowing they may not have any infection they do not have fever they do not have cold or any flu okay but just painful or swollen glands okay that could be a sign that they are in an asymptomatic stage two of hiv infection here if they go for an elisa test or nat test as well nucleic acid test okay your nat test is much more faster in result and uh, the it, it can it gives you an approximately correct answer as compared to ELISA, NAT test can give you the correct answer. NAT test stands for nucleic acid test. Okay, So HIV antibodies are detectable in your blood. Antibodies means the body, your body is trying to fight these HIV viruses. So the antibodies are present in your blood. So if you have HIV antibodies, it is uh, it is seen that you, you have been infected with HIV in the past 10 years. Next, we have the stage three that is symptomatic. Here, symptoms are quite mild, okay? Uh, but the immune system starts to deteriorate. You are losing a whole lot of your T lymphocytes. T lymphocytes are the ones which, which you 
which is formed in your body during your childhood and early adolescence because of your thymus gland. Okay, but once you are an adult, thymus gland is no longer active. It is active only during your childhood and the early stage of adolescence. Okay, after that, thymus gland is just a piece of tissue that stays uh, behind your sternum. Okay. So uh, T lymphocytes are made during your childhood and, the, and your uh, um, early ad adolescence. Those T lymphocytes are completely eaten up, killed by the uh, virus, HIV virus. So your immune system deteriorates. It goes bad and bad, bad day after day. And then as soon as the immunity comes down, slowly all the opportunistic infections like common cold, okay? Even, uh, even in India, if you go to any part of India, especially in urban areas, okay, you breathe in the air, you are breathing in a lot of tuberculous past life, okay? But over a period of uh, all these decades, throughout all these de decades, we as Indians have naturally uh, acquired an immunity against most of the tuberculous bacilli, most strain of tuberculous bacilli, we have a natural immunity against it. You will not find the same immunity in people who are not from Indian origin. Ethni ethni their ethnicity is not from Indian origin. They may not have this immunity, but who are staying in India, who have been born and brought up in India, they have this immunity. Okay, So these all are opportunistic infections. These bacteria and virus is already present in your atmosphere. But till now, they had never caused you any harm because your immunity was strong enough to make sure that they lay off your uh, organs. Okay, But now the immunity has started to deteriorate. Now all the opportunistic infection like tuberculosis. First of all, it is tuberculosis, then typhoid, then uh, frequent bouts of your influenzas. They keep coming back to you. Okay, And in some cases, cancers as well. <laughs> And finally, you will reach the last, last stage of HIV infection, that is AIDS. So this is the area where the, your immunity has completely gone. Uh, it is completely weak. It is completely gone. So in all the severe, uh, small opportunistic infections, what you have acquired during stage three, th those will deteriorate here. Okay, That will become severe and chronic in stage four. Okay, And that is the final. This is the stage where you... Uh, diagnose that the patient is or conclude that the patient is in the AIDS stage. Okay. Pa patient is suffering from AIDS. Okay. So these are the four stages of AIDS. Is it clear to all? Next, coming to nutritional problems in HIV. Decreased nutrition intake, definitely as soon as you, like as soon as your infection uh, deteriorates, your immunity de 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 deteriorates and your body is not able to keep up, you will lose, lose all the appetite. The patient will lose all the appetite, okay? And because of that, there will be less nutritional intake as well. Gastrointestinal malabsorption, different forms of infection can attack any organ. Okay? Sometimes it could be your GI system or even if other organs are under attack because of the feverish nature of the infection, because of the general malaise and general uh, intensity of the infection, your absorption GI system will not absorb nutrition properly. ART is begun, uh, you, you will start antiretroviral therapy as soon as the person is detected with AIDS. Okay, not You will not wait for the final stage. As soon as the patient is detected with HIV antibodies, as soon as it is seen in your blood sample that you have HIV antibodies, you will be put on ART. Okay. We we do we don't we won't waste time to wait for a particular stage to come and then start ART. As soon as it is seen that this sample, this blood sample has uh, viral viral copies of HIV, uh, it has HIV copies or even it has HIV antibodies. We start with ART, antiretroviral therapy. Okay. 
increased nutritional requirement will be there because the body is pasting up. Okay, the body uh, body are similar to tuberculosis patient. Here also you will see muscle wasting. The body is in a constant stage of catabolism. Okay. Then we have the psychosocial uh, factors like even if they require a high nutritious diet, but usually AIDS, such, information, uh, such infections are seen in people who come from the BPL background, below poverty line, okay, or from the background where they are not aware, rural backgrounds, etc. Okay, um, and they uh, the areas like red light cities, okay, red light red light areas of any any uh, urban city, they do not have good healthcare facilities in these uh, areas. Okay, so limited access to healthcare. Okay, so these all are the other factors that will definitely affect the nutrition of the affected infected patient as well okay then we have micronutrient deficiencies like uh, vitamin e deficiency vitamin d deficiency selenium vitamin c etc all these deficiencies is ideally corrected with nutritional supplement okay we usually don't go for food based uh, nutrition here because there is a high chance of malabsorption so it's also always better to take the help of nutritional supplements to correct all the micronutrient deficiencies here. Then macronutrient deficiencies, we have to be uh, very careful in calorie counting, uh, giving them liberal calories, okay? Uh, in terms of carbohydrates, be liberal and focus more on protein. Fat can still be less, okay? You don't have to increase the fat intake. Fat, fat intake, can, you can keep it low, but increase the carbohydrate intake First priority, second priority is the protein intake. So, uh, this is the flow chart, okay? Uh, nutritional problems in HIV. It's a, it's a uh, vicious cycle again here in HIV. Again, it's a very vicious cycle. So, uh, in, uh, in HIV, there is a immune, uh, your immunity is impaired, okay? Weak body, the body cannot fight illness. But in, when, the, when the body goes into this stage where your body is not able to fight illness, you are weak, you are suffering from general malaise, fatigue, uh, and lethargy, general lethargy, okay? This is the area where opportunistic infections will come and attack you, okay? The immunity is weak. The natural viruses and bacteria which is around your atmosphere, anywhere, even you, if you go to hospital or if, if, if you go to the clean, cleanest of um, high society offices, high society households even if you go to the cleanest area except for the areas where we we have hepa filters okay hepa filters are high efficiency particulate uh, filter filters okay uh, air, air conditional filters so uh, except for rooms that has hepa filter all the other rooms in any given institution will definitely have access to bacteria and virus just present in there atmosphere just present the air which we breathe so when the body goes into a state of weakened immunity definitely opportunistic infections like diarrhea tuberculosis malaria pneumonia okay these things will come and attack the patient and when the when uh, when the patient is under all these opportunistic infection definitely malnutrition will follow okay already they, their appetite was less but along with additional infection their appetite is completely gone and they go into a stage of malnutrition. Okay, so these are the signs and signs and symptoms which you can see in the when the patient has HIV as well as malnutrition. The entire body is swollen, swollen feet, swollen body, pale skin, eyes, hair, dry skin, dehydration. Okay, underweight, lack of blood. They are very thin because because of muscle wasting. You can actually see their skeletal system coming through. Okay. So this, this is a vicious cycle of the nutritional problem that goes on and on, okay? This is the reason why we focus more on nutritional supplements here. So nutritional supplements are not supposed to cure HIV, but they, they can just help to do some symptomatic management to an extent. To an extent, nutritional supplements can do some symptomatic management. That's it. It will start in stage three. Malnutrition, uh, malnutrition will start in stage three. So what are the components of medical nutrition therapy in India? So first is your screening. 
uh, as soon as you you uh, see every hospital has a family planning and counseling center uh, no hospital will use hiv room aids room aids counseling room they will not use such kind of words uh, around um, uh, outside their consultation rooms or examination rooms okay it's all it's always under family planning center counseling center national counseling center they will use some counseling term or family planning term okay these terms are used uh, and the patients who have been screened and diagnosed with hiv antibodies or hiv copies in their sample they are directed towards the counseling centers some counseling rooms okay their entire detail is taken up their name address Okay, place of residence, permanent address, everything. Okay, everything that is required to identify this patient, to uh, to track this patient uh, back to from where they come from, their family, etc. All this information is taken, uh, and it is registered. The patient, every case, HIV age, uh, every HIV case that comes to a hospital under the counseling center, it is registered under the NACO. Okay, National AIDS Control Organization in India. So. NACO, NACO will have the reg registry of all the patients so far to track each of the cases. Okay, so uh, under the screening, you you get the details of which patient is affected by HIV, and once you track these patients, you have to screen them on a regular interval for the nutritional status. Okay, nutritional supplements and correcting the nutritional status can help them uh, have a healthy livelihood for as long as possible okay so that's the motto here we uh, the nutritional nutrition cannot cure them but at least it can aid in some symptomatic management okay so screen them for every four months or six months what micronutrient deficiencies they have or what macronutrient deficiencies they have and uh, whatever deficiencies comes up in their blood test etc it has to be corrected immediately okay so the next uh, second step is referral all the AIDS patients are referred to specific AIDS center or uh, ART centers from where they can avail drugs free of cost. They can uh, avail uh, counseling services because they all, all they will all definitely go for go uh, under a severe emotional trauma. Okay, they will require some psychological counseling as well if one comes to know that they are uh, they are infected with HIV. Okay, a lots of counseling is required. So referral services will include all these areas where they can go and access free nutrition. Okay, uh, from uh, which primary healthcare centers or secondary healthcare centers provides them free nutrition, uh, free uh, medication. ART medication is free of cost in India. Okay, free medication, free counseling services, etc. Okay, from which all areas they can find these recommendations those list is given out to them okay pamphlets are given up to them then we have the assessment here again we will do the nutritional assessment we'll check if the patient shows certain signs and symptoms of fear anxiety depression are they going into a state of social isolation okay there are certain people who belongs uh, who have a family who have a family responsibility and who come under the radar of hiv infection Okay, they automatically go into certain mental health conditions that can affect their family life as well. They can, that can affect their livelihood and their bread earning capacity as well. So we, we usually look out for signs and symptoms that indicate that this patient may be going, for, uh, going under certain mental health conditions and adequately we have to give them uh, counseling services as well. Okay, so, uh, The counseling services for HIV patients are also free of cost under the NACO program. And all the anthropometric measurements like height, weight, height to uh, hip to waist, waist ratio, uh, neck circumference, body circumference, okay, uh, the amount of uh, body fat, okay, the DEXA scan, etc., can be done here. Uh, if possible, okay, just to see that what kind of muscle wasting stage the patient has reached. And adequately, we can switch up their diet. Serum albumin level. Okay, serum albumin level. We are checking just to see what is the amount of protein loss uh, the patient is suffering from, because protein loss will lead to muscle wasting.
if you wish to know more about uh, the recent guidelines, you can definitely go and check the NACO website. NACO stands for National AIDS Control Organization. And it is under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Okay. Even the blood donation rules, okay, blood transfusion rules and regulations which we have in India, all the guidelines for blood transfusion, okay, that is also given by NACO. Which all or organizations or which all hospitals should have registered blood bank, all the blood bank registration comes under NACO. Okay, National AIDS Control Organization. For India, it's NACO. Every every uh, nation has their own uh, scheme or their own wing of AIDS control with different names. But in India, it is NACO. Okay. So after the assessment, we have uh, intervention. Intervention will stand for giving them ART therapy, giving them nutritional interventions as well, or giving them ORS, giving uh, giving them uh, protein sources from the primary healthcare centers, etc., free of cost. Okay. So oral supplements, uh, you can prescribe them MCT oils. An example is shown here: MCT oils and hydrolyzed whey protein can be given. Hydrolyzed whey protein is much more easier on the stomach. Hydrolyzed means the uh, it is already partially digested protein. Okay, partially digested protein. Uh, so the body does not has to produce a lot of enzymes to break down this protein. So that is the reason why we used we we use hydrolyzed whey protein. It's easier on the gut. It is partially digested. So this hydrolyzed protein is very easily absorbed. Okay, because we have to keep in mind that the uh, that the body of the AIDS patient is already in a stage of malabsorption. Okay, so that's the reason why we give them hydrolyzed whey protein. It's partially digested. Okay. Then high protein, high calorie diet. High protein, high calorie diet, it is usually milk. Okay, milk is a high protein and high calorie diet. Omega-3 uh, fatty acid, beta-carotene, uh, all the sources of non-vegetarian as, well, as well as vegetarian. And it's better to go for, if, if it is about omega-3 fatty acid, it's better to go for nutritional supplements rather than depending on the diet. Beta-carotene, your fresh fruit juices. Okay. Vitamin C and vitamin A, again, you can go for nutritional supplements. If the patient can't keep, uh, does not have the appetite of eating raw fruits and vegetables, you can definitely take the help of nutritional supplements here. Vitamin B12, nutritional supplements, and usually you, you can give them cereals and pulses, porridge of cereals and pulses. Millets, all the millets can be included in their diet. That will also uh, cut off the requirement of vitamin B12. Vitamin A, uh, immunization can also be given in, via injections or via oral supplements. Vitamin A can be given only if the patient is deficient in vitamin A. So next coming to antiretroviral drugs, ART drugs. Uh, ART drugs are usually given in combination. Okay, every, every subject is given ART drugs based on the combination they require. For example, uh, a pregnant woman who has been diagnosed with AIDS, she will get a different combination of ART drugs as compared to a non-pregnant woman or any other adult, okay? Uh, teenagers will have a different combination, okay? Uh, and based on your viral load, based on the viral load, different combination is suggested, okay? So even in pregnancy, ART drugs can be taken, but the combination is different, a different a form of drugs are given in pregnancy okay so in detail i will not go some some uh, some oral supplements are also given in the textbook you can read about it because you are not supposed to prescribe art drugs it is only given from the counseling centers okay and any nurses or doctors who have uh, who have 
who got a needle stick injury while treating an AIDS patient, even if they uh, even if they have no viral load, okay, but still ART drugs will be given to them for a month. Okay, if any doctors or any any healthcare practitioners, biomedical based handlers, okay, if they got needle stick injury while taking care of a RBD positive patient, okay, uh, definitely they will be put under the prophylaxis of ART drugs. Prophylaxis means uh, drugs used to compact the infection. Okay. So ART therapy is a daily use. On a daily basis, you have to take this drug. You cannot uh, skip any day. ART drugs has to be taken on a daily basis. A combination of HIV medicines to treat HIV. ART can save the life, but it cannot cure HIV. But recently, we have come across certain cases, very few cases, one out of lakhs and one out of million cases, uh, in which we have seen uh, continuous use of AR, ART in an er in early childhood and in early infancy, it has cured the child out of HIV. Okay, uh, more research has to be done into it. Okay, these cases are very rare in which ART has definitely cured HIV. It is very rare. It depends on one's genetic combination as well. Okay, how well then ART should work. It depends on the genetic combination as well. So uh, based on your viral load, viral load is very important in seeing what kind of ART drug should work and how, how long of a lifespan a person can have, okay? Some people who have, uh, who have HIV, but it is undetectable. The antibodies are undetectable, less than one copy or two copy per ml of blood, sa blood sample, okay? Those people cannot transmit AIDS. Okay, uh, though, though, even if they are infected with HIV, but they have a very less viral load, okay, like 75 copies, one copy, two copy, even a thousand copies per ml of, uh, per ml of blood, okay, uh, per ml sample of blood, even they cannot transmit HIV from one, one person to another person. Uh, and if a person is not taking ART drug, okay, if a person is not taking antiretroviral drug, that if you if you take their blood sample, you will find more than 10 million copies, okay? A, a, a person who is not taking ART drug, who, who is not under ART therapy, you'll find more than 10 billion copies of uh, HIV virus in one ml of blood sample, okay? So these patients will definitely reach the last stage of AIDS, that is a fi final stage of HIV infection, AIDS infection, very soon as compared to other HIV patients. So it, it is it completely depends on what kind of viral load the patient, the subject is having. Okay. So the functions of ART uh, therapy, it reduces the amount of HIV in body, the copies, the copies per ml of blood that will be reduced. It reduces the risk of uh, HIV transmission. If you start ART therapy earlier, as soon as you doubt that you may be suffering from HIV in the stage one or stage two itself when you start H uh, ART therapy, the risk of transmitting HIV from your body to others, other person's body through usually sexual intercourse or through vaginal birth, C-section birth, okay, from mother to child transmission, uh, transmission, et cetera, these things can be avoided. It prevents HIV from advancing into AIDS, as I mentioned earlier. People who are suffering from, who have HIV infection, but who are not on ART drugs, you will find more than 10 million copies of viral load in per ml of blood. Those who are taking ART therapy, hardly 75 to a few thousand copies of um, viral load will be there in their blood sample. It depends. Again, it depends on various factors as well. It also protects the remainder of the immune system. Whatever T lymphocytes are gone, it's gone. You can't, you can't bring the T lymphocytes back. But putting a person on, a, on regular ART therapy, that can save as much as uh, T lymphocytes as possible. So it can safeguard your immune system. So coming to page number uh, 287, you can read in detail, okay, the effects ART uh, has on nutrition. For example, um, Few years back, I had a student who was uh, who was a lab technician, and he got uh, while while collecting a sample from a HIV patient, 
he got needle stick injury and by god's grace there was no uh, copies uh, in his sample but still the student was put under one month of art therapy but the effect of this art therapy the drug from the week one was so impactful on his health that he had to take completely one month of bed rest okay so it depends the art uh, art drugs they do help in improving the lifestyle and the and the the, the living um, way the, the way of living for the aids patient in a, in the long term but it comes with a cost of side effects okay with the the initial initial stages of art the first few months of uh, if if you put a patient under art uh, the symptoms are so severe the side effects are so severe of uh, art drugs that it impacts the nutritional status more than any other malnutrition that has occurred in the person's life uh, in the li lifetime okay so it definitely art art drugs definitely affects your nutrition okay because your appetite will go and it induces certain forms of headache dizziness and vomiting and continue and that that also continues vomiting similarly like uh, uh, like in chemotherapy drugs okay uh if you if you have a come across a cancer patient who was under chemotherapy you can ask them what kind of symptoms they had because of these drugs definitely vomiting loss of appetite continuous vomiting okay the same effects are seen in art drugs as well okay so art drugs definitely affects the nutrition in forms of decreased ap appetite continuous vomiting and um, gi disturbances and because of continuous vomiting even if they are hungry they refrain from taking food okay so they have to be put on iv fluids and they have to be put on nutritional supplements iv fluids uh, ng tube feeding okay in the initial few days, uh, stages in some extreme cases we have to go for these measures okay the drugs uh, can cause metabolic changes as well uh, like indinavir indinavir is a form of art okay zidovudine indinavir okay these are common uh, these are very common art drugs they uh, it can raise your blood sugar level and cholesterol levels some other uh, artery drugs can cause a uh, worsen your triglycerides or cholesterol levels so they uh, they affect the metabolic changes as well some can deplete the natural reserve of vitamin vitamins which you have in your body like vitamin b6 then it then the next phase is the nutrition that affect art okay there are certain food for example coffee tea too much of caffeine in the food too much of spicy food okay too much of seasoned tempered food that will affect the art drug absorption okay so uh, while you uh, while, while any patient is put on art drugs the counselor from the uh, family counseling family welfare and counseling uh, department they do tell what kind of food you have to avoid usually it is to refrain from over indulging in coffee caffeinated drinks okay too much of spicy food has to be avoided because anything that that will trigger or that, that will cause agitation in your gut is uh, will will definitely cause malabsorption of art drugs okay there are certain food that can hinder the um, absorption and certain drugs that can help the absorption that is vitamin c okay presence of vitamin c can uh, uh, like help in more absorption of the art drugs certain minerals can hinder the absorption like calcium etc certain vitamins and alcohol can uh, exa exaggerate your side effects okay whatever side effects you are having with art drugs if you are an alcoholic if you consume more alcohol during uh, during your time period on art drugs it can exaggerate your sy symptoms as well so that's a relation between antiretroviral therapy drugs and its effects on nutrition so on page number 287 there is a table 14.1 various specific side effects like anorexia anorexia means not eating food okay nausea vomiting uh, loss of taste sensation of taste is uh, deteriorated constipation diarrhea fever